Welcome to another edition of the Defo Show with Luby here on the Five Reason Sports Network. The Miami Dolphins got it done. Taron Armstead will be their franchise left tackle. Yes, they won't block the blind side of Tua, but the left tackle is the most preeminent position on the line. It's probably the second most preeminent position in football behind quarterback. And Taron Armstead is one of the best in the league at doing it. He has had some injury issues, but he's a guy that will shore up the offensive line with Connor Williams, one of the better guards in the league. And the Dolphins still have a lot of room under the cap and have a late first-round pick that would be perfect for an offensive lineman. So things looking up for the Miami Dolphins today. We did Dateline Dolphins with only John Congemi, longtime ESPN football analyst, and Dolphins insider, or as we like to call it, Finsider. John is on with us each week. Thanks to Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill of Key Largo. We hope John doesn't mince words, and we look to talking more about the Taron Armstead signing and what else the Dolphins could do right now on the Defoe Show with Luby on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Jeff DeForest, Mike Luby Lubitz, the Defoe Show here on Ion Channel, and always a pleasure. It renews your faith in mankind to not only see this gentleman looking as good as he does, but to to have him as part of our program. And we welcome the show for a little Dateline Dolphins. Uh, The great John Kajemi, longtime uh, TV analyst uh, with ESPN. Uh, Maybe you got out a little too soon, uh, John. Uh, I don't know. You're thinking about watching. I I wish I could have stayed. They kicked me out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was unfortunate. And, you know, that's when they were dealing with all of the, uh, I can say this, uh, you know, you're very humble about it, but uh, the diversity issues were not necessarily lining up in your favor. (laughs) It was you and Rachel Nichols uh, that were being ostracized (laughs) unfairly. By the people at ESPN. Uh, sorry, John. Uh, now I got to turn my back on you. But um, oh, wow, I mean, I know we talked about this before, but uh, the cycle has sort of been completed now. With Al Michaels signing this deal uh, to go with Kirk Herb Street at Amazon, you got Joe Buck moving to uh, Monday Night Football with Troy Aikman on ESPN, which just a few years ago had a guy rolling around on the sidelines in something called a booger mobile. So I mean, uh, they have gone a lot to a lot of extent to uh, you know try and uh, get away from that whole uh, image. And, uh, you know, you've had uh, other guys uh, making big scores uh, as they were on a move, Collinsworth, uh, et cetera. But uh, it strikes me that, you know, and, and you did this uh, for a long time for a living. And, uh, you know, your, your analysis uh, was always spot on. And, and yet, I, I don't know, are these guys really illuminating the game to uh, a level where you don't think anybody else is even in this category? Where they're, they're worth this kind of dough? I know, you know, I, I'll take it if somebody offered me $10 million tomorrow to do the same thing. But. It does seem absurd, doesn't it, that that this is where the networks are investing their money in, instead of maybe, uh, you know, spreading it around a little bit and having a better supporting staff. Well, all I'll say is that those guys are very talented at what they do, but there are a lot of people that are on that level. Yeah. And it all depends on, you know, what flavor uh, you like. You know, it, you bring it back to your favorite food. Well, that that's my favorite restaurant. I want to go there. But I went to this other place. It's pretty close. I mean, I, I can't tell the difference. Or, or or a nice glass of wine or a bottle of wine. If you're blindfolded and you taste one, you think it's Camus, but it really isn't. And, you know, I, I think it's the same thing with, with broadcasters. Um, I think that people that make those decisions fall in love with certain people for whatever reason, and it kind of suppresses other people from moving around the board and, and getting to that level. So the guys that are at, at the top do a great job, but there are also plenty of others that that are just as good, uh, if not better, given the opportunities. But those opportunities sometimes never come. It's funny. I mean, if there's a guy that I don't really care for, uh, his announcing style, uh, doing a game, uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the screamer. Uh, I, I'm just not. I, I never was. Uh, you know, obviously, you have to raise your enthusiasm level if you're doing play-by-play or color analysis at certain points. But if you're at a fever pitch on the very first play, like a lot of guys are, oh, my God, can you believe that? <laughs> Three yards on first down. That's fantastic. What genius. You know, I, I'm not I'm not a fan of all of that. And, and there are guys that, that have made a living uh, doing a lot of uh, yelling and hollering uh, during the course uh, of the ball game. But uh, in general, I, I don't know if it's somebody that I like that's doing a game. OK, that's good. But I mean, people are going to watch NFL games no matter what. I mean, if they had nobody doing the uh, the ball game, you would think uh, at least it, you, you would tune in, uh, you know, every Sunday, whatever game it is that you have uh, uh, sort of earmarked or benchmarked for your uh, 
you know, for your viewing pleasure, you're going to watch it. It doesn't matter who's in the booth. I've always felt like when I was watching a game at home or I was broadcasting a game, and if I was sitting at home at the same time, all I want you to do is, is give me the information and let me decipher how I want to accept that. Um, it's funny because you, you could go the full spectrum. You could have a play-by-play guy. You know, let's take, for instance, Gus Johnson. You know, he's going to say, can Jemmy 15 yards, Youngstown, <laughs> Ohio. He did it. And, that, and that's it, right? I it, mean, you happen to pick a guy that uh, I, I okay. just, uh, you know, had, had major issues listening so, to uh, with so the screaming. So the other, the other way, the other spectrum is, you know, can Jemmy drops back. His mom makes cookies on Thursdays because they're good luck. And they they interject everything on their board that they have to, that they have to get in. And it's just like, all I want you to do is tell me what, what's going on and let me kind of pick and choose what I, what I ingest. Right. Well, we're seeing, uh, you know, also uh, the appreciation of what the Mannings are doing uh, in that uh, alternative broadcast on Monday night football. Now I wasn't a huge fan of the crew, uh, Steve Levy, uh, obviously, is a, is a professional, and, and, you know, I thought he did a, a decent job of doing a play-by-play. Uh, Lewis Riddick, uh, who uh, seems to be very intelligent when discussing football, nonetheless, I, I don't think that whole thing that he does in the studio was applicable to a game, and, and that seemed to me what he was doing. And then, I don't know, I don't know if you, uh, you know, you probably had some contact with Brian Greasy uh, when you are both at ESPN, yeah. and mm-hmm. while he may be a great guy, I don't know much about him other than that he's the son of Bob. But uh, vapid, I would say, would be the word I would use to describe. Uh, his, his, he did nothing for me to illuminate anything and seemed to be playing, you know, a distant second fiddle to uh, Riddick, who, who was dominating uh, that whole thing. But, but but it was an absolute mess that they had going. So people naturally gravitated towards the Mannings. And one of the things I was reading about, you know, all of these uh, different transitions that are going on that made perfect sense to me uh, was that, that you would really like to, you know, hear from a guy that you felt like you were sitting in the living room with yes, him right. watching the game. Or you were in the stands with the guy, and, and it was a pleasure to be sitting next to him because the things that he was saying were making you think, man, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, this guy can't dribble his way out of a paper bag. <laughs> I, I like watching. Uh, I, I didn't get into the Manning broadcast until probably halfway through because I, I, I actually forgot. You know, yeah. Somebody kept telling me about it, and I was like, I'll just watch the game. You know, I'll, I'll figure it out myself. Then I tuned in. And it was actually, I, I liked it a little bit more because they had a guest, they, they bounced things back and forth. And you could tell Peyton's kind of living and dying on every play yeah. because he, he knows what's, what he's doing pre-snap. He's going yeah. through the mind of the quarterback. He, he sees the defense. He's telling you where the ball should go uh, because the quarterbacks aren't as good and the offenses aren't as good. Sometimes it didn't happen. So Eli would make fun of him. Yeah, you're, you're over you know, four tonight, you know, you're right on par for what you should be doing, but actually the ball should have went there, you know? So you're kind of looking at it through the the lens of a guy, one of the greatest guys to ever do it. And, and funny at at the same time, because they're getting on each other and you don't have to, you don't have to fight through the, the BS of a football game watching that. Yeah. So they kind of, the, the charm of the, of the show, in my opinion is they take all the, um, the, the the dead action in a game and converse over it while all of a sudden you're back at it, you know, without knowing that next snap's coming uh, when you're ready to when you're ready to get new information. Well, they don't force yeah. anything. Like that's why I like okay. it. Like the analysts, uh, the play by play guys are fine; they're doing their job. But color analysts, a lot of the time, and that's why I liked what you used to do. They force it. Peyton and Eli don't. Peyton and Eli, it's like they forget they're on TV and they just yeah. talk about the game. Where you learn something, but it's not like Mayock, where it feels like he's trying to be a neurosurgeon or a rocket scientist. Like <laughs> they don't yeah. use terms like that. Like they're the guys that know those terms, and they don't feel the need to use them. They feel the need to just talk about it, like they're talking to any person about a game. And you get like I haven't really gotten into Monday Night Football in years, just because I'm tired. I got to wake up early, and I know I have to. Uh, I'm not going to get to finish the game, but. To watch them for a half, I do it every, I was doing it every week because I was learning stuff yeah. without knowing I was learning it. I was just enjoying it, and it was just different than a broadcast I've seen in a long time. Yeah, it, it, it 
sometimes when you watch a, a broadcast, you feel like a baby in a high chair and you've already eaten like three jars of the applesauce, but grandma's yeah. going to yeah. shove another spoonful <laughs> in your mouth. You're like, no more, no All more. over your face. I don't yeah. want any more. Yeah. That, that sometimes, you know, you get that feeling watching either NFL or college football. What was the green uh, baby uh, peas? Oh, uh, you know, was that spinach? Uh, you know, was that with spinach yeah. in it? No, peas. They love yeah. doing peas. Yeah, yeah. And that would be peas. smeared all over your uh, kid's mouth. Yeah. And, uh, Not thinking, a good look. You know, what, what the hell am I doing? This <laughs> I'm torturing him. Here, here, here have a banana. <laughs> uh, all right, John Kajemi with us. Uh, and it's State Line Dolphins. Uh, and the Dolphins are making moves. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm starting to buy into this idea at least to this extent that uh, Mike McDaniel, whenever he sat down with whoever it was that made the decision to hire him, uh, actually said, hey, hey, these are things that we definitively need to do if we're going to be able to uh, run my system that was successful in San Francisco and also improve off what was a 9-8 and eight season a year ago, 10-6 and six the year before. Not bad. I mean, uh, unusual that you would even be a coach in a spot to try and fix a team that was actually – above 500 the last couple of seasons, usually you're walking into a, you know, just, you know, minefield of problems, uh, you know, and we all know the problem has been the offensive line. So, so they signed this guy. What, what do you know about, and uh, how do you pronounce Taron Armstead's name? Is it Taron? Taron? Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, nine years in the league, I didn't realize he'd been a lot, around so long because when I saw the signing, I thought, wow, this is a big deal. But then you start looking at the uh, – other side of it, and uh, the negatives are he's been in the league nine years already, taken a bit of a beating, and never played a complete season uh, as a starting left tackle. And Tua is left-handed, so the left tackle is not necessarily uh, as uh, you know uh, important as it would be if he was uh, a right tackle in this spot. But uh, what, what do you make of the whole thing? I mean, what's your thought? I, I did think that McDaniel at least – laid out some kind of prescription for change, and so far, so good. They're, they're honoring his commitment to whatever plan he had. Well, I think when you look at Armstead, he was the number one rated free agent, you know, across the board. All, all the guys around the league that are making up these lists, he was at the top of the list. And you're getting a starting veteran offensive left tackle for under $20 million yep. a, a year. You know, that's probably the going, that's, you know, that's the cutoff line, you know, whether you're under or over. And you're getting him five years. Uh, he's going to be a 10-year vet. You mentioned nine years in the league. Does he last five years was my first Well, thought. probably probably not. I, you know, you're crossing your fingers if he does get there. Because, you know, you look at the Rams and what they did with their offensive line. You know, you had a tackle just retire after a Super Bowl victory. Yeah. He was into his 40s. So, you know, you're hoping that you don't fight the injury bug, at least for the first couple of seasons, at least next year with Armstead and you go through it, but the dolphins as to your point, to you guys point that they address needs in free agency. They really did. They yep. just didn't sign the biggest name to play defensive tackle in, you know, Sue a few years ago when you really maybe didn't need a, a defensive tackle, you know, they needed an offensive tackle. They needed to bolster this offensive line. So you go out and you get Armstead, you go out and you feel like, okay, we need another, you know, offensive lineman you get Connor Williams from the Dallas Cowboys so now you pencil those guys in on the left side and it's kind of a battle of you know survival of the fittest on the other side because you you could probably kick Jesse Davis and challenge him in as a center because he's played every position along the offensive line is he better at center than he is at right guard or right tackle maybe I don't know give him a shot to, to battle against Michael Dieter me personally Dieter's more of a natural guy on the inside so he pencils in there nicely you got Robert Hunt who seems to be a young guy that they really of all the young guys that they've had on this roster and drafted he seems to be the star of the class so you, you have him at right guard and then you you're you're crossing your fingers that Eichenberg can come back after playing you know musical chairs with him in his rookie year put him at one spot on the right side of the offensive line and let him play there let him play there for you know from the first day of OTAs all the way through preseason and see if you've got a young right tackle that you can you can play and win games with for the uns, you know foreseeable future. Well, and what's interesting is it's funny we talked about this I think last week is that they haven't gone out and gotten the big splash right. Well, even this a big splash, you just said it. He's not even top ten paid tackles like offensive linemen in the league for what they just spent on him so as much as it seems like this big deal it actually wasn't it still was smart 
And it was not only for a position of need, but it was, yeah, he's not going to pr- be protecting to his blind side, but he's great in run protection. And again, everything we've noticed by everything they've done is beefing up the run game, not just because they want to play 1970s football, but because they want to protect Tua. The more they run, the better the run pass option is, which he's probably top five in the league at RPO. So it's Mike McDaniel coming in, and I'm sorry, this all these moves scream Mike McDaniel to me. And surrounding the young quarterback with tools to succeed, which the last regime didn't do. So, and and, and regimes haven't done it. You just said it. Ndamukong Su was a great name, but it supposedly didn't really fit the system they were running. So it was like that was an owner's pick. Yeah, that was not a that was not a GM or head coach. And pick. none of these moves have been that. And all these moves seem like Mike McDaniel's like this is what like Defo said at the beginning of the show. This is what we need to succeed. And then they've gone and done it, which we haven't seen in a long time. For this franchise. Well, you know what? And what ties it all together is, you know, you get Ingold at fullback. The Dolphins haven't had a fullback on their roster in, you know, a couple of years. They tried uh, Chandler Cox from Auburn a couple of years ago. They drafted him. They re- really wasn't the offense to do it in. So he kind of, wait, you know, finds his way on the outside looking in. And now you have an offense where you've got probably, again, 48 tight ends on the roster. That's great. <laughs> Go, it'll figure its way yeah. out, right? Uh, you're going to have multiple offensive, you know, formations and motions and things like that. And then you're going to try to hit them with speed because you got Jalen Waddle and you got Cedric Wilson on the inside. Those guys are burners. Now you're crossing your fingers because the Dolphins, although they went out and tr- tried to fix this offensive line and free agency, and remember, we still have the draft well ahead of us. So that might remedy what I'm going to say, but you're going to cross your fingers with re-signing Preston Williams and, you know, going to the bank with Devontae Parker, that these guys are going to be healthy. These guys are going to last on the outside. You know, this draft has a multitude of wide receivers. It has a bunch of edge rushers, and it has a good offensive line core. So the Dolphins may not be done in what they're doing, but they may want to go out and find a wide receiver, a true alpha guy, tall, you know, lanky, can go up a number one guy that they can hang their hat on that would complement what they did in free agency. If I'm the if I'm the general manager, if I'm the head coach, that's where I'm that's where my attention is because those guys plug and play a lot faster. It seems for the Dolphins, maybe not for other organizations, but they plug and play faster than offensive linemen had in this organization over the last 10 years. I don't know if you ever felt this way uh, during your professional uh, playing career, John Kajemi, and we're with John Kajemi on Dateline Dolphins. And of course, John that was a uh, starting quarterback at, at Pitt and, and followed in the footsteps of the great Dan Marino and a, a big high school star here at St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the most powerful and, and uh, a powerhouse uh, force in high school football all around the country for years and years, uh, end up in the Canadian Football League. But did you ever feel like just a piece of meat, a commodity? Uh, and I'm thinking about this in the context, uh, you know, my vision of Baker Mayfield is him lying and writhing in agony on the field last year, he uh, had a, a torn labrum or something, some yep. kind of shoulder problem of significance, yep. I guess, his non-throwing shoulder. Still going to be something that would be an impediment to any kind of comfort that you would have standing back there in a pocket while, while 300-pound guys that run four three forties are coming at you through a porous offensive line. And, you know, he, he did everything he could. I mean, he played the entire season. And then the Browns, uh, after investing a number one pick in, uh, what, four years uh, of Baker Mayfield or five, uh, you know, said, uh, sign our man. And he saw it coming. And, and then they go and get Deshaun Watson, which was the blockbuster that took place uh, late last week. Uh, so uh, y- your thoughts, A, on just being, I mean, well compensated piece of meat and with a lot of commercials. But, uh, you know, it, they had no sympathy or empathy for the fact that the guy, you know, did everything he could last year while uh, obviously in, in need of surgery immediately after the season. That There was no loyalty, uh, you know, and uh, no respect given to the fact that, that this guy was dedicated to what they were trying to do a year ago. Yeah, it seems like that's, that's the way uh, organizations on the outside, for sure, uh, the way we, we perceive it, it looks that way. I don't know if it's truly that way on the inside, but on the outside, it sure does look that way. Very I mean, counts, the guy, huh? the guy, yeah, the guy did yeah. everything he could possibly do. Uh, and they didn't win enough, but they weren't a very good football team. You know, they kept they kept changing. You know, what their identity was going to be, and then Baker was injured. He didn't play up to his standard, and now he's kind of on the outside looking in because 
as you look around the landscape of the National Football League, uh, you know, I didn't think Matt Ryan was was going to leave the Falcons. I figured he'd be a Falcon until he retires. Yeah. You know, Carson Wentz is on his third team. And you know, a few years back in Philly, you think that guy's going to be a 10 year quarterback for the Philadelphia sure. Eagles. Right. Yeah. Um, you never know what what the next play or the next game or the next year is going to bring. But for guys like Baker, uh, he's probably got one or two, maybe one destination to potentially start in Seattle. Um, but other than that, I don't know where he's going to challenge to be the guy. It, it, it's it's tough. It's tough out there. But at least he has the luxury of being the first pick overall. And he has that to kind of fall back on. And if he gets another opportunity, which I'm sure he will, he's going to have another chance to kind of resurrect that good feeling about Baker Mayfield and what we saw him as a collegiate athlete and how we saw him when he was healthy move around the NFL and be able to make plays and do all the things a, a number one overall draft choice should do. For me, it was holy Johnny Manziel. Uh, you know, I, I'm watching this guy, you know, a try, and uh, here, here's Cleveland. Uh, you know, I, and I, you know, to make a change is one thing. Now, now, what do you think? Uh, what is your thought about the whole Deshaun Watson? Yeah, I call it like I'm, uh, you know, like uh, you know, I, I'm a wrestling announcer, right? Uh, you know, the situation. Yeah. Uh, you know, I feel like Gordon Soley uh, putting it in that uh, terminology. But uh, the, the uh, situation with Deshaun Watson, which, uh, you know, as a uh, you know, free thinking human being, not prejudging anything. I mean, the ink wasn't even dry yet on the uh, order from the grand jury not to indict. And uh, all of a sudden there were like 10 teams dangling, uh, obviously money and uh, all kinds of compensation in front of Watson and the Houston Texans. Uh, you know, I mean, you would say that if you get a star quarterback in his prime, I mean, if Danny had been traded in his prime, Dan Marino, what would he be worth? Three first round picks? Uh, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, what did you think of the whole thing? Because it still is unclear whether or not the NFL is going to step in. But I would imagine, as I was talking about with Luby earlier in the show, I mean, uh, you would think, uh, what is it? Haslam? Is that the guy? Not, not Jimmy, Udonis, Jimmy right? Haslam. Yeah, Haslam. Yeah, the piece of work. Yeah. That owns the Cleveland yeah. Browns. And, uh, you know, he's probably on pretty good terms with Raj because he seems like, a, you know, a fairly decent guy. And, uh, you know, do you think he called uh, old Raj Goodell and said, uh, hey, listen, you're not going to do anything about this kid, are you? <laughs> I mean, w wouldn't you want to know that uh, before you gave him like $300 million uh, over the next couple of seasons? And, and, you know, trade it away, whatever it was that you had that, that was going to be, uh, you know, worth, you know, trying to, uh, you know, salvage some kind of a future, um, you know, to get a guy that he could be great. I mean, he should prosper there in Cleveland, should he not, if nothing happens in terms of suspension? Well, Amari Cooper is the, is the move that I would say that, you know, probably prompted them to even delve into further to go get Deshaun Watson because you've got – You've got a guy now that can change a game on the outside. Yeah. Uh, you need you need that guy at quarterback. And, you know, Deshaun Watson, before all this legal problems uh, happened a couple of years back, you would you would consider him top five, yes. top six, yep. right, quarterback. Uh, he was doing great. Uh, yeah, and on a poor team also. Right. Uh, and on a team that he probably needed to do that. He probably needed to throw the football more. So now you, you bring him into a situation where, you know, that – that conference and that that division primarily is, you know, anybody, you know, Cincinnati's like the team to beat now, but are they going to be able to do that again? You know, you always have your doubts about a team that comes out of nowhere and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're gangbusters. They're going to make a few changes in the off season. Well, any, any of those teams, Baltimore could do it. Pittsburgh, you know, has to do it. And obviously Cleveland has done it now with the move at quarterback and wide out. They're trying to, you know, take knock Cincinnati down. And when you do that, with a talent like Deshaun Watson. Now, off the field, you've got plenty of uh, on your plate in terms of is he going to be able to get on the football field to be able to, to throw a pass for the Cleveland Browns. But you're right, Defoe, the way the league is today, it, it's just the red meat, you know. And as soon as they got the quasi-green light, you know, it was yellow, it's going yeah. it's, it's to go, you know, and everybody steps on the gas, and, and they're off to the races to try to sign a guy that may not have – an immediate future or, or an, at least an unclear future in the national football league. You know, and I, I don't know where they stand on this anymore because uh, the policy has been so inconsistent uh, about uh, sexual assault and spousal abuse and, and all of the different stuff that unfortunately, uh, you know, I mean, is a persistent problem uh, may not be 
rampant throughout the league, but, uh, you know, they've had consistent problems with it. Uh, you know, to have uh, 20, 22, I guess it is, 23 civil yeah, 20, lawsuits yeah. against the guy, right all now. alleging uh, the same thing. You know, that there was, uh, you know, some uh, form of sexual assault being uh, uh, orchestrated and executed by by this guy who, um, you know, the, the league is always uh, touting the fact. I mean, they got the pink out there for breast cancer research. Uh, you know, everybody's wearing pink shoes. And, and that's great uh, to try and celebrate and, and, and bring attention to all these women's causes. But but what kind of hypocrisy would that be if uh, they allowed this guy to play and uh, there was even the slightest implication that, that uh, even one of these alleged victims was telling the truth. Yeah, I, I think it, they've got the league's got it, their hands full in terms of, you know, you penalize a guy that put fifteen hundred dollars on a parlay. He was born. Yeah, he's he, out he for the was, year. For the he's year. Done, he's <laughs> done for the year. I don't think twice. I put more than that through their horse book. Uh, at, uh, <laughs> one more Trust fell me. out of your pocket going, exactly. hey, going to the window depot. No doubt. And, 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 you know, and now you've got a guy that, you know, 22 civil lawsuits and it's just like, let's sign him for $300 million. And can, and he's going to be the one of the guys you talk about every time you turn on the TV because he's one of the stars of the league. Well, I, I'm sure the uh, lawyer who I believe has all of these civil cases, uh, you know, and uh, has been, uh, you know, in, at various press conferences uh, addressing this whole thing from the other side. Uh, I, he was probably thrilled to see that contract signed, I, I would imagine. That, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and a giant portion of guaranteed money. But um, and it's interesting, though. So the Browns then, do they become a contender in your opinion or what were they won already? And the other thing that's curious to me, I, I always like Jarvis Landry, John Kajemi. Me I, too. I don't know, what, what's the story? I mean, why would you if you were going to make these moves? Why would you let this guy uh, split from uh, Cleveland? And I thought he gave everything he had to the Cleveland Browns. I think that was more of a money issue than talent issue i mean jarvis has played almost every snap yeah. uh, until this year you know since he set foot from lsu to the miami dolphins and then the cleveland browns uh he had a couple of injuries this year but that's a guy that you want on your team i think it was more of a let's cut release maybe we can bring him back if nobody picks him up at a lesser amount because they've had to dole out so much cash in this deshaun watson deal they got to start trimming in other places they sign amari a cooper you know, the, he's a he's a, a nice auxiliary piece to have on the inside, but at the price tag he was at, maybe it was uh, a little bit too much for what they could afford. So they let him go and hoping hoping they could get either him or someone like him in return, either in later in free agency or through the draft. All right, this comes under the heading, John Kajemi, and this is the reason we have you on a show of uh, Splendid Me Lucy. All right. I mean, Matt Ryan has what another year or two left uh, in the National Football League at, at you know a, any kind of reasonably competitive level. Maybe, maybe he could pull a Brady. I don't know, but uh, he had a good season last year. Uh, you're the Falcons. You're, you're going to take a forty million dollar uh, dead, dead money cap. cap hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By trading this guy, or, or you know, uh, sending him. I guess they traded him to uh, Indianapolis. I Indianapolis, don't know what they got yeah. back in return. A third round pick. So nothing of any great significance to take this cap hit, which uh, they then uh, go out and sign Marcus Mariota. Who, uh, we, we've seen Marcus. I mean, uh, you know, he has flashes here and there where you're thinking, all right, this guy's okay. But more often than not, he reverts back to being what he is, yeah. which is Marcus Mariota, yeah. a, a guy that, uh, you know, is not going to be a quarterback capable of. And, and I know the whole Trent Dilford thing ruined this line of thought, but uh, you don't think of Marcus Mariota carrying the Atlanta Falcons to the Super Bowl if Matt Ryan you know, couldn't win one, uh, you know. And so why wouldn't you just play the guy the last couple of years of his career or whatever he had left on this contract so you wouldn't have to eat the money now if then you, you were going to turn around and sign Marcus Mariota and, and basically tell your fans, hey, listen, we're not going to do much this year. All I can do is agree with you, Defo. I, I don't understand <laughs> it either. Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and actually the Falcons were quite competitive last year. They yeah, yeah they had the a last, shot. The yep. last week of the NFL season – with a chance to get into the playoffs with Matt Ryan playing quarterback. You know, they go out and they get a, a, a game changer at tight end. They have enough, you know, around him and as an offense, decent defense. Uh, but you're right. It's not like the Ravens defense is going to start for the Atlanta Falcons in your scenario with Trent Dilfer. You know, that that's a team that's not going to beat anybody just on the defensive side of the ball. So you bring in Marcus Mariota, but you have the crutch of the money that's going to carry over for – it's going to linger for years. 
uh, a couple of seasons. Why not let, you know, probably the most famous Falcon, you know, through his tenure sure. that's ever worn the jersey, let him let him finish out as a Falcon and get somebody in the draft. You know, that you, you're going to, if you think you're going to be 500 or worse, what are you going to be with Marcus Mariota in this, basically the same team? Are you going to challenge for the playoffs or are you going to be kind of a 500 football team? I, I think the latter. Doesn't make sense unless Ryan himself was, uh, you know, it, saying, hey, please, guys, do me a favor. You would think he would want to retire. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, how rare is it that a guy gets to play his whole career in one spot? Right. And, uh, you know, he, he's been around a, a long time. I mean, uh, Matty Ice, uh, you know, has been in the league, uh, what, uh, upwards? Is it 15 years uh, that he's been At around? Least. Yeah. It feels, I mean, it feels that was like in, in, the, in the Jake yeah. Long draft with Bill Parcells uh, as the head of the Miami Dolphins, yes. and he went with the left 08? tackle. Yeah, that was like the mid-2000s, like yep. Wow. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, I would think that if you were going to have to – Oh, you four? can't do anything Gosh, with the, with the capital. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're compromised on your cap, uh, which uh, I don't know. I mean, you're not going to be able to go in excess of it. So why would you put $40 million worth of dead money on yourself when, uh, you know, I don't have a quarterback that may end up doing something with, with Indy because, uh, you know, Wentz wasn't quite the answer there. But, you know, Matt Ryan would have made a big difference with that team, I, I would think. I, I would think so, too. You have stability. You, you've got a guy. I watched him practice down here for three days before the Dolphins played in the preseason. And uh -huh. you could tell the difference between anybody else on their roster, anybody else on either team, really, and, and Matt Ryan. I mean, Matt Ryan was clearly the best quarterback on the field. It didn't matter if another team came out and started practicing, unless it was, you know, Tampa Bay or, or somebody like that. Yeah. I mean, Matt Ryan still had a live arm. He still was accurate with the football. It came out on time. Uh, maybe he's lost a step in his escapability, but that's not what he's doing right now. He's beating you by getting the football out accurately and, and being able to put pressure on opposing defenses with his, with his right arm. So he still does that at a pretty high level. You take him to Indy with a great running game, a good offensive line, and a hell of a defense, he's got a better chance to win in Indy than Atlanta does with Marcus Mariota uh, playing quarterback there. All right, a little uh, clarity on a quarterback carousel. John Kajemi with us here. And, of course, uh, John's appearance every week brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, Mile Marker 104. That was John Kajemi right here on the TV show. It'll be the Five Reasons Sports Network. John raving about the signing of Taron Armstead, what it means to the offensive line, what it could mean to the run game, what it could mean to the offense as a whole. Talks about some of the needs the Dolphins still have and ways they can address it. Yes, Armstead is not protecting to his blind side. But he will be a big part of helping with the run game. He is a guy that not only is one of the best offensive linemen in all of the game, he is a leader. He's a guy that can help the young guys. Look, Eichenberg wasn't good, but he was a rookie. So there's hopes he could be better. Austin Jackson seems like a bum. Not sure where he's going to go. Jesse Davis seems like he's pretty gone. But Dieter's another guy that really did a decent job. And Robert Hunt did a good job. So that gives you between Hunt and... Connor Williams with a Dolphins sign from the Cowboys, one of the best guards in the league, and Taron Armstead. That gives you three guys that should be able to start and excel on the offensive line. Now the Dolphins have that 29th pick in the first round. That's a perfect spot to get probably the best, if not one of the best, centers in the draft. And they still have a ton of money to go and try and get a right tackle. So they've actually started to rebuild that line, something they haven't done in years, something the Dolphins have needed, and something Tua hopes to Take advantage of Mike McDaniel is really getting things done. It feels like there are other rumors going on around the Dolphins. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. But big thank you to John and Jimmy joining us. Dateline Dolphins. Thank you to Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill of Key Largo. And thank you to checking us out. If you want to check out what we got going on each and every morning, 7 to 9 live. Just Google the Defo Show, D-E-F-O. Also exclusive content today. Uh, always got a lot going on. Believe Network. Search Believe.com after hours and every day right here. Our South Florida content, the Diva Show with the Luby on the 5 Reasons Sports Network. Recently, we realized it's not just hurricane season that can hurt us. Any time of year, things can happen to your home or business. And the insurance company can be your friend, but they also can be your enemy. Horizon Public Adjusters, Justina Testa, are here for you to help this process go so much easier. Before you call the insurance company, call Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa at 954-809-8752. Would you go into court without an attorney? So why would you go up against an insurance company without 
Verizon Public Adjusters, and Justina Testa. Seven to ten times more money recovered with a public adjuster than if you went on your own. If there's no recovery, there's no fee, give them a call at 954-809-8752. Why go up against insurance companies alone when you can have Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa on your side? Play the ponies in style at Champions, the outstanding simulcasting room at beautiful Hylia Park. Yes, the grand old lady of thoroughbred racing has never been more vibrant, and you can wager on the races from the top tracks around the country while enjoying a cocktail at the Brass Rail Bar or any of the fine food served throughout the facility. If poker is your game, you're covered in style, and you can play all your favorite Vegas-style games, including blackjack, craps, and roulette in Hylia Park's sizzling hot casino. Get a player's card when you walk through the door for all kinds of generous amenities, including our favorite, free play. When you come out to the ultimate casino and entertainment destination, Hylia Park.